Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the ABZ Show. Today, we have a very special guest, one of the first investors in the region, in the MENA region. We have Omar. Omar, how are you? I'm great. Thank you, Abe. I know you're in Toronto right now, so uh, tell me more about you and tell me more what you do. Excellent. So I am a venture capitalist. I co-founded and uh, manage Dash Ventures. It's a MENA-based, globally active venture capital firm. Um, more about myself, maybe how I got into venture capital is um, I spent two years prior to setting up Dash with another uh, regional pioneering venture capital firm, spent about two years with them, and then had the opportunity to go start off something on my own with, with these guys. And it was very difficult to go from a pioneering firm that has a setup and has a great regional brand to literally starting from scratch. So although I don't call myself an entrepreneur, I feel like the jump that I made by leaving that firm and leaving that comfort, and you know, they were raising a new fund and going to start my own where there was no guidance, everything was set up and left for me to decide. I found that to be quite entrepreneurial and, uh, and risky. And I'll, I'll never forget, I mean, I would say easily the first two to three years, every day, I would say today might be the day where, you know, there'll be no dash will no longer exist. This might be my last day and we'll just have to, we'll just have to end it here. But Alhamdulillah, I can say this year uh, in October of 2021 will be 10 years since Dash's existence and establishment and registration on paper. So very proud of how far we've come. I still feel like there's so much more that we can do. Yeah, and um, I think I remember I, I met you before Dash, uh, and I, I think we even pitched. You know, at that time I, I thought it was called Act, right? What was that? What was the firm called? It, had, it was called Accelerator Tech. Previously, before so they they had rebranded to Silicon Badia, mm. but it was Accelerator Tech, which was the growth stage, and mm. then the early stage was IV Holdings. Yeah, which yeah, was, I remember. Yeah. And I remember we 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 did pitch Accelerator Tech. I remember, and I uh, and I, I remember all of you who were who were in that room. Now everyone run, does his own thing and runs. And I remember you and Faisal. And anyway, it was a lot of. Uh, uh, it was a lot of you in a room, uh, and that experience for me was the first of its kind when we pitched a proper institutional investor. And yeah. you know, and uh, I even like you know, I know we're I, I know me and you right now are in hats and like cool uh, gear, but I think that day I wore a suit, <laughs> you know what I mean, and like in a and a tie. And uh, if you know people who know me well now, they know. I'm not a suit guy anymore. Like I despise suits and it was so uncomfortable. And I felt like people were like, um, you know, looking at us uh, in, in, uh, in, in like a very, you know, granular level, like looking at every line and, and keep in mind, we were three entrepreneurs at that time that we've never done this. We were young. Like I, like, I remember I was, 29 and my two co-founders was 26 and 25 so there were we were like super young back then and and and, and we did get an offer eventually from you guys but uh, it was very low bold and thank god we didn't take it back then but but it was uh, very intimidating it, it was i have to say it was it was and um uh, again and 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 you know i told you when we were doing this earlier uh, this show was to talk about the good things and the bad things. And I'm not saying that was a bad thing. I think that was a very eye-opener experience for us because we, you know, this was when we really needed growth money. We weren't like profitable. We weren't losing money, but we were at that, you know, the floating era that, you know, a lot of startups was and needed a big cash injection because the startup at that time uh, needed, you know, needs a lot of money because it's very human capital intensive. But yeah, so so tell me more about Dash. Tell me like some some of your learning, some, some stuff that you you you've experienced, you know, memories that you say I'll never do this again, or memories that says you know what, let me do more of this. I'd love to hear more about that. 
I mean, but just going back to 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 that picture that you painted of that room and, and the suits and stuff, I have a couple of things to say there. Well, number one is, like you, I despise being in, being in a suit. And unfortunately, I was, you know, I've been a banker all my life. My first job out of college was I joined Merrill Lynch in London. And then I left London and I joined Merrill Lynch in, 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 in Dubai. And then I went back to Amman and I joined the bank. And I spent eight years with that bank. And until I went to do my MBA, I lived in a suit. And every day I put on a suit and a tie or I had to go and buy a, a, a new suit. I just despised putting on the suit and the tie. I tried to look the part and okay, try different, how to knot it differently. And, but it was horrible. And what I love it from the day I started at Dash. By the way, just so you know, when I resigned from my own old job, I resigned on October 15th. October 16th, I had started at Dash. I went to the to our, you know, I didn't even have an office yet. I was using like a space in an, in, in an existing uh, uh, office. Um, and I think October the 15th was the last time I wore a suit or at least a pants and a shirt to the, to the office. I now only wear it when I'm sitting with, if I'm going to a bank, where I need to talk to bankers, or if you know you just you have to wear a suit just because you're dealing with let's say uh, uh, DFIs or, or 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 multinationals or something like that. Um, but when you talk about in that room, yeah, I can see how intimidating it is. Not only every line, but you know we're judging every every behavior, every move, your body language, all that sort of stuff. So it is very intimidating. But the learning is for you, and the learning is for us. So you went and you, me you, you mentioned that we gave you an offer. I don't know details, but we gave you an offer and then you didn't take it. So obviously the offer was not uh, uh, reasonable or was not fair. And that's one of the biggest learnings from me um, from, from not only that experience, but from, from ex you know, there was another experience that I had, which was when you really like a company, and you like the founding team and all the stars aligned and everything is right, economics and, and terms and the legal stuff at the end of the day should never, ever get in the way. If you really, if, if there is that, that chemistry and it comes together, nothing that you put down on a piece of paper should get in the way of getting that transaction closed and, and, and partnering up. And that's probably one of the biggest lessons that I would never let a valuation or deal economics or a term or something that, that you fight for, get in the way. You know, you, you have to sacrifice. Two sides always have to compromise. You'll never reach a compromise without both sides sacrificing. Um, but if you're dealing with somebody that you genuinely like and you want to partner with, you'll always be able to come to, to, to terms. Um, so that's one, one big learning. Does that mean the, the, there was a regret there? Or? No, 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 no regret. I mean, I'm just messing with your head. I'm just messing with your head. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, uh, part of Accelerator Tech. I was part of Ivy Holding. So yeah, yeah. even when this offer was made, it wasn't me who was preparing. The most important thing is those two years were school for me. And I've said this multiple times to everyone on that team, which is it was a school. And what I did is what I took with me when I went to set up Dash, I was also young, and I don't think two years of, of VC uh, experience is enough to tell you with all confidence, oh, I'm going to start a fund right now. I know what I'm doing. And I would be lying to myself if I thought I did. Uh, till today, uh, I'm learning, and we're all learning. Every, every VC, even those that have raised $100 million funds, they're all first-generation VCs. They're all learning on the job. We're all learning on the job. But the point I was trying to make was... Um, I don't have, there are, no, there are no regrets, but oh, I was saying what I took with me was things you do, but most importantly, things you should not do, right? So there are things I was very, when I joined after the MBA, I was extremely passionate. You come out of the MBA, the MBA does something to you where it opens up your mind to your capabilities and your abilities that you've never, never known before. And it gives you confidence because you're dealing with teams, you're dealing with, with people, you have all of these projects, you do consultancy jobs, you have to travel, you're learning things from scratch, then you realize, okay, I can do this. So you realize your capability and your potential. So that gives you a little bit of confidence. So when you step into a new role after the MBA, you're not going to take anything for, for, there's no such thing as status quo. Your goal is to take the status quo, dissect it, shred it to pieces, and see what can be changed. And I think I was, a, I was very eager 
to to voice my opinion and and and, and see where things can be can be changed. But you know, when when you have an existing team there, and this is how it's being done, it was it's very difficult. And that's the beauty about starting your own thing, which is take what you've learned, take the passion of you wanting to create something yourself and do it and learn along the way and iterate along the way. And that's what makes Dash so special, which is Dash is not a venture capital fund. I don't have LPs that have invested in my fund where I have a framework of how to invest and I have to invest this way for 10 years, 10 to 13 years, which, are, which is what some fund uh, 10 years are for in terms of maturity. Imagine doing that in a world like the MENA region. Imagine me doing this in 2011 and me having to invest the same way or, or operate the same way for 10 years. Look at how far the region has come from 2011 to 2021 over the last 10 years. It, is, it has completely evolved. I mean, you can't even recognize what it was uh, prior to 2015, 2016. So the beauty about the way we structured Dash is we have every year we revise a strategy and we say, what are the trends that are happening now in the region? What should we look at? What can we learn? What's happening outside? Because we also invest in North America. So we have investments in Canada and we have investments in the US. We've looked at many opportunities as well in the UK, particularly FinTech. What do we learn from those experiences and how do we apply them here. So not only in terms of portfolio management, but also what are the best practices? What are the best VC practices? And how can we change our strategy and change our model to apply that uh, to the region as the region keeps evolving, literally quarter over quarter. Every three months, things are uh, evolving in terms of you know new markets. So I don't like to say we invest in this stage. We don't invest in that stage. That we do, there's nothing that we can't do. Yeah. Everything is open to us. We have preferences. This is where our strengths lie. This is where we can add the best value. This is what we're good at. Uh, uh, so we have sweet spots and we have preferences, but nothing is going to stop us. We're always open to exploring things. And I think that's what makes Dash very, very special. Super cool. And I, I think um, I would have to agree with you on, on uh, the two items that you actually like really uh, hit the nail uh, on its head with... Um, I've been an I've been an entrepreneur most of my life. In the last two years, I crossed over into running an accelerator and running uh, more of a, you know, the accelerator is still mini funds, right? So, and uh, keep in mind some of the companies that pitched, and and the our investment criteria was very early. So we generally only invested on likability and how. And what's the strength of the team? You know, what's their experience like? What, what do they bring differently? Because, you know what, you know, maybe this is me being an entrepreneur telling you, I, I hate people with one idea and then they never tell you and they're like, oh, I, uh, I, you know, I'm not telling you my idea until you sign an NDA. And I'm like, you know what? Sure, bring it. You know what I mean? Like I'll sign an NDA, whatever, you know, like it's not about the idea. It's about the execution. Uh, and, you know, I work with a lot of e-commerce sites. They say, just bring us the business and we'll deliver. And I'm like, you know what? And I've seen like even simple businesses in e-commerce crash and tremble just because their traffic doubled. You know what I mean? And it, again, it's execution over and over. So that is really, you know, when you invest in, in team and invest in, uh, in, in uh, mentality of the team, this is where, you know, I think it's paying off. I don't know if you know that, but my first startup was in 1999 in Canada, by the way, that got acquired in six months. But I never tell people about that because it was kind of a borderline dating site. So we, it's kind of not something, it was a social network in all fairness. In 1999, that's you know, even pre-Facebook days, right? It was very basic. And, and anyway, and what happened was um, I've seen the whole tech ecosystem, not even on Mina, but globally how it, it really transformed. And I can give you that uh, in actual numbers. When I took over, started bootcamp in 2019, end of 2000, sorry, end of 2018, um, our programs used to get around 300 applications. Our last program uh, in 2020 got 1400 applications. In half the time, usually the, uh, the screening criteria is open. So there is tons of, you know, A, there's tons of people trying to do something. And B, I think there's so much technology out there that people can white label. 
and actually uh, package up in a in a product of some sort. You know what I mean? Again, it's execution that really makes it, and not uh, and not the idea. I think the idea is right now everybody's copycatting, and there's nothing wrong with copycatting, but it's how the way you do it, a and b, and how you localize it. In my opinion, again, that you know, I'm not looking for a unicamel. That's my new term, or you know what I mean? Like, um, I'm looking for somebody that can, you know, you know, 90, what, 95% of the um, uh, acquisitions happen between 25 and $35 million. And that's not a bad exit. You know what I mean? So that's, that's, that's something that, you know, we should, we need more of those. And with more of those, then we'll create the unicorns. You know, people want to sh- we'll go unicorn hunting, but, you know, there needs to be, you know, it's a funnel, right? So it needs to go through that. So I think when you look at all the new investors, that are not, I mean, think of all of the investors that you have in our region. Think of globally. Not every single one of them is going to, uh, even in their lifetime or their experience, they're going to manage to hunt and catch a, a unicorn. You have to be really, really, really good and have been in the space for a long time or lucky. And, and yeah, we have to admit there's a lot of luck in this business as well. I mean, think of all of the things that have to have to happen for it to for it to work. But you still have many successful VCs, reputable, credible VCs that are very happy and they've made great returns for their LPs and they may never hit a they may never have a have a unicorn. But it's just they know how to spot the right ones. They come in early, they help them, they exit quickly and that's and that's how it works. And you just need to repeat that over and over. Obviously, you know, you, you never want to be one one thing that you never want to be labeled as in the VC business is a one trick pony, right? It's sort of like these people that come up with a you know with a song, a one hit wonder. You come up with one song and then you can't even repeat that success. The whole point of this business is to show that it's not luck, but it's it's the it's the methodical approach that you took to find, close, help support manage and then exit this business and you have to do it twice three times in order to show that this is this is not luck and i think this is very important in our business in terms of execution i mean it's 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 i agree 100 percent. and there's you know not not a theory but the way i like to think about it is you have two teams and you give them the exact and the teams could have the same skills similar backgrounds similar education same skills you give them the exact same uh, 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 money, give them the funds. And what will differentiate one team from the other is the incremental decisions that they make, because they might both be able to execute. But when you execute, you're making a decision. Every day is a decision. And watch the incremental decisions that they make and how they make those decisions and how they adjust and how they fix themselves. Yep. And you'll find them going in two very, very different paths. So an idea is is mean means nothing. An idea is great, but until that idea is formulated, well thought out, written down, tested, experimented with, it's nothing but an idea. I've had I've come up with amazing, amazing ideas. Man, I'll never forget one time in in, in London when my first job, um, uh, I used to walk over and take the tube and walk. I'd have a long walk to get to the Merrill Lynch offices on on, on Chester Street, and um, Back then, you know, we had our, our phones, but I was always thinking, I looked at my, that little mobile phone, and this was in 1999, 2000. I'm like, it would be amazing if I could listen to the radio on this phone. How, imagine if this phone became also, I had access to like music when I was walking, and I shared that idea with, with Dima. She's like, oh, Amal, you should do something about it. That's, that, that's a good idea. You, you did nothing about it. Look, look at it right now, right? But it's, it's, uh, if you're not going to do something about it, it's, it's nothing but an idea. You, you know, and we, we do a lot of events and we meet a lot of these um, young, energetic founders. And, you know, I love the energy, of especially younger uh, founders. But, you know, I keep telling them one thing and I'm like, listen, I don't want to be mean to you when I tell you this, but nobody's going to fund your dream. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it, it's a dream. Just that was like, and then they kept, you know, they gave back to you and they say, well, I need the money to build it. And I'm like, you know, I think... I think a part of you finding the money is what you need to learn. <laughs> Honestly, you know what I mean? Like, uh, and, that, and that's something that I've been seeing a lot of uh, these days. And I'm not talking about hustlers or, you know, like hustlers in a, in a, in a good sense. I'm not talking about the other kind of hustling, but uh, there is quite of those. And um, I was amazed a couple of times, and, and I'm sure you get the same thing because I get 
you know, you get what five pitch decks a week or, or minimum, you know, and people talk to and people poking you on LinkedIn and all that. You were talking about dreaming. I mean, I, you know, you want them to dream big because at the end of the day, you want this big grand vision, yeah. but it's, there are those that can dream big and have a grand vision. That's easy to do, by the way. It's, you know, it's easy to, to dream big. Then it becomes a little bit difficult to articulate that properly so somebody can understand it. Yep. The difficult part is now breaking down this vision into pieces and blocks and steps to say, this is what I want. It's like a Lego, right? You get this beautiful big package of a Lego. It looks great. Whatever it is, my son now is it's addicted to Legos. He's got all these spaceships. When you first get the package, it looks great. Then you open up the box. And it's like all these different pieces and different things. Like that. It's all broken down. And that's exactly how you have to break down your grand vision. And yep. Start putting in the pieces. And then each piece ends up coming together. It takes time. It takes days. And in the startup world, it takes years. So you want to do this and that. Fantastic. I love it. I'm with you. We've got to start now. But uh, definitely that story uh, resonates. Yeah. So, all right. So I promised I would send a question your way, a curveball. So if, if you had the chance to mimic a superhero or had your own superpower, what would that be? Um, it's a difficult question. I mean, I think, I think the way I thought about it, and I've been asked this question many times, over various times in my life. And I think depending on what you're going through and what stage of life that you're in, you would choose a different superhero because what you're thinking of is what you're going through now and what superpower would you want uh, uh, to do that? Um, for me, I would, I would make, I'm gonna make it very, very simple. I'm gonna relate it to just because of where we are right now. And for me, I would love the ability to just travel back and forth in time, Matt. I'm, first of all, just to give you a little bit of context, we all make mistakes, right? I don't think there's anything that I regret, but we all make mistakes. And the mistakes that we make lead us to where we are. Sometimes you wonder, what would happen if I took this decision? What would happen if I took that? And I think, I mean, I have, I've had many crossroads in my life where I was asked, Omar, do you want to go this way or do you want to go that way? And it could have been many things that I can go back to my college days. In my college days, when I went to university, I went as a, an electrical engineer. And I applied to the engineering school. And I was an electrical engineer for the first two years of my life um, in college. I was only an electrical engineer because that's what my father made me choose. I remember filling out the application, him there, and he told me to put it down. And, you know, this was back in the day. And I'm one of those generations where I sort of, was confined by wanting to make him proud and do what he wanted. Sure, sure. I think everybody went through that phase. So, so, so I did that, but then I switched. So I was an electrical engineer after two years. And I remember people would, would, would walk around and they would walk around. Some of the, the folks in my engineering class would walk around with a teacher with a t-shirt that says, you can't spell geek without double E, double E as in electrical engineering. And you know, man, you're in college and I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I, I play tennis and I play basketball. I'm like, I'm not a geek. Don't call me a geek. This is not me. And, you know, for, it was like, I couldn't wait to just break out of it. But you know what? Truly deep down inside, I think I am a geek. But what I did was I changed and I went into business without letting my father know. I always loved business. To me, when I was a kid, I was always like trading baseball cards and basketball cards as a kid and, and collecting caps and doing this. And what if you wanted to sell it? I loved stocks, even as a kid, you know, trading, knowing that you can invest in a stock of a company, make some money that blew my, that's what I wanted to do. If I switched without letting my, my father know, but I always wonder what if I stayed down the engineering route and I stuck to what his plan for me was. What if when I left Merrill Lynch and I came back to Amman, I had two options there, one and two, I chose one. What happened? The other one was a good one. What if I chose that scenario? Where would I be now? So I would love the ability to be able to travel back, make those different choices, but then, and, and then live out that scenario and see Omar today at these maybe three different timelines, four different timelines, what different Omar uh, would be. And then maybe stick to the one that's the most, that the best version, you know what I'm saying? My, one of my... Uh, uh, motos and something that I always try to do and I always live by is just every single day, how can you be the best version of yourself? And as long as I keep doing that, how can I, you know, what can I uh, uh, 
uh, read today that will make me uh, more exposed than I was yesterday? What can I learn today that will make me smarter than I was yesterday? What can I do today in terms of uh, exercise or something to make me fitter or healthier than yesterday? And if you keep doing that and you always strive to be better, I'm, I'm so far away from where I want to be. Um, but just if every day I'm a little bit better than the day before in terms of my behavior and how I am with my kids and how I am with people around me. And if you keep living that way, you're always going to be happy. You'll never have regrets. Your mistakes will never haunt you. And, you know, because you keep looking forward and you're working on yourself. And you know that if you want to, any, any impact that you want to make, any change that you want to make, it always starts with you. And if you think about it this way, and this is how you apply yourself, uh, I think you'll, 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 you'll live a very comfortable and happier life. I love it. It always starts with you. That's something I think I'm going to call this episode. It always starts with you. I think that's a, that's a good topic. You nailed it right there. And um, in saying that, thank you very much for coming on to the show. We, it was an honor having you. It was a, I think it was a great conversation. And uh, until next time, stay tuned. Take care. Bye. Take care.